Jesus is Lord. And he was such a nice Jewish boy. <laughs> Jesus changed my life. And he's still in the life-changing business. As Paul said, the love of Christ compels me. You know, Randy, I think most people don't realize how much darkness there is it, in it the world. It can't be just coming to church and getting pumped up with the faith. You message. and I are all going to have to have something of faith in us. Father. Jesus died to save sinners, and you are a sinner. Well, first off, I want to simplify everything and tell you. Everything in life is a test. I don't care what you're experiencing. It's a test. Now, you may not recognize it, but the sooner you take a step back and say, what am I, what's happening? What am I going through? The sooner you can take a step back and say, is this a test? What am I supposed to do with this? The quicker you'll be able to come to grips with it and find peace in your circumstance, and then you'll be able to give thanks and count it all joy. It's through much tribulation we enter the kingdom of God. I didn't write it. I just read it. It's a test. Everything in life is a test. And everything in life is spiritual. The quicker you come to grips with that, you can remove yourself from the natural, from the physical, and you'll be less mad about what you don't like if you can identify it as a test and it's spiritual. What is God wanting to do in you, through you, for you? If you're the righteousness of God in Christ, it is not to you. You think on that for a while and you'll understand what I mean. I still see everything going back to Israel. And as a prophetic future, I see everything going back to Israel. So when I observe and I see things in the world, I have to ask, what does it mean for Israel? And I believe what we're seeing right now is another opportunity for God to draw his people back to Israel. We didn't leave Nazi Europe. Those who stayed perished. Those who left had an opportunity for life. We didn't leave communist, czarist Russia and then communist Russia until it was too late. By the time you get into the 1970s, if you said you wanted to leave Russia, do you know? They, they were called refuseniks, but do you know how they were classified in Russia? If a Jew said, I want to go to Israel, they tried to apply for immigration. They were deemed mentally incompetent because why would anybody want to leave Mother Russia if they were sane? And then they were put in work camps, gulags. And I'm not saying that was universally the case, but that was a common thing. Eventually, there was so much pressure from the outside world, Russia began allowing Jews to immigrate to Russia, uh, to Israel, I should say. So I go back to the question now, thinking of Russia and the Ukraine. Why did Putin invade Ukraine? I mean, apart from the fact he's a tyrant and he assumed he could get away with it and he wanted maybe the, the ports or he wanted the natural resources or he wanted whatever had been built up there. Power-hungry people want power, and with power they want money and control. I don't know why he went, why he wanted to do what he wanted to do, but I believe he was driven to do it. Was it a satanic thing? Did the devil drive him to do it? Pff, I don't know. Did God draw him like put a hook in the jaw of the bear to, the, to go to Ukraine? Someday he'll put a hook in the jaw of the bear to go to Israel. I don't know why, what went through his head, but I believe God wants to shake loose from the tree of Russia the rest of the Jews that have failed to leave and to shake loose from Ukraine the rest of the Jews who have yet to leave. I have a friend who I, I serve on the advisory board of his ministry in Romania, and he was telling me uh, very recently about uh, 
busloads of Jews who had come from Ukraine. They were brought into Romania and then flown to Israel. And he participated in those busloads being loaded on planes to go to Israel. They never would have left otherwise had it not been for this chaos, had it not been for this invasion. Already, there have been not Jews, but three million people have fled Ukraine since the war began. During the Holocaust, there were between 1.2 and 1.4 million Ukrainian Jews who were killed. Huge Jewish population was there. Between 1991 to 2019, 300,000 Ukrainian Jews moved to Israel. Some believe that there may only be 43,000 people left in Ukraine who self-identify as Jews. 30,000 are expected to move to Israel. Why did Putin invade Ukraine? I think God wants his people home. Since 1970, there were 2 million Jews who left Russia in total. But of those 2 million, 1.7 million have left since 1989 when the wall came down and the Soviet bloc lost its power and the superpower became less than a superpower. The Israel embassy, Israeli embassy in Moscow estimates that there are 90,000 Jews remaining in Russia. Other sources suggest that number may be as large as 150,000 Jews. It's a very small number. But you know what? One is a big number to God. Consider your salvation and the value God placed on your salvation, that it was worth the life of Jesus Christ, his son. You being the one there may be 150,000 Jews in Russia. There is a thing called the law of return, whereby Israel uh, must allow Jews to return. And that law of return details that anyone with at least one Jewish grandparent or who has a spouse who is a Jew or who is a convert to Judaism will qualify under the law of return, and Israel will allow them to make aliyah, to move to Israel, home to Israel. According to that standard, there may be as many as 600,000 people in Russia who would qualify for the law of return. Why did Putin invade the Ukraine? I don't know. But we're seeing, I believe, an end-time reality take place that God is bringing his people back to Israel. Israel is at the center of God's heart. Israel is at the core of redemption history. Israel is the magnetic center. It's a spiritual thing. God will not take his eye off the prize. Israel is the prize. The enemies of God want to destroy Israel. That's the prize they desire. Iran wants to wipe Israel off the map. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Randy Weiss, and I only have about 30 seconds to tell you about my brand new book, Pray, Fight, Win. I know what you're thinking. What's the book about? It's about going on the offensive. It's about giving the devil the old one-two with your prayers. But it is so much more than that. It's a journey that we take together to find the deeper meanings within the righteousness of Christ and the treachery of the devil. I hope you'll check it out. I think Putin, if he were an honest man and you could just talk to him over a cup of coffee, and I think if you could ask him Dude, what went wrong? And if he wouldn't shoot you in the head, you know, for, for suggesting maybe it wasn't going the way it was supposed to, 
he might admit he never dreamed that he'd face such a resilient enemy as he has found in the Ukrainian military or their citizenry. I think the world is shocked at what has occurred. I think he assumed it would be a short war with a long parade celebrating his political genius. Pride would suggest that might be the case. And I think he assumed that his people and the world would shake in fear as to the military prowess of this great nation that he ruled as a tyrant. And he did what he did for the greater good. I don't know how you bomb hospitals and wipe out innocent civilians and not call it a war crime. But I don't think he ever assumed that he would be accused of war crimes or called to account. Because I really think he assumed it would be a short war with a big parade. And I don't know how it's going to end, but it hasn't been a short war. And a big parade is unlikely at the moment because I, I see something happening that I find shocking, astounding, startling. Germany, peace-loving nation, they learned their lesson after World War II. They didn't quite get it after World War I, but they got it after World War II. They are not interested in military stuff. Germany, out of the blue, totally unexpected, has doubled its military budget. This is unheard of. This is, this is crazy stuff. This is end of the world stuff. Germany has decided to, in addition to doubling its military budget has, is infusing more than 100 billion euros to create the world's third largest military on earth. It's happening right now. We're sitting here talking about what we're discussing and Germany is arming itself to the teeth. Why? What would have, even the liberals in Germany have risen up and said, forget that climate change stuff. We need guns and bullets and bombs. We need planes and tanks. Why? Because they see a menace rising up in their midst. Does anyone think if Putin would have marched into Ukraine and taken it in three days, that he would have stopped? The neighboring nations were Terrified. They had to be terrified. What would stop him if he got past this? Where's the walls? Where's the fences? Where are the borders? How far would he go? Maniacs do what maniacs are allowed to do. And the people of Ukraine said, we're not giving up our country. We're not giving up our homes. We're fighting. Now, they may give up their homes. They may give up their lives. We don't know what's going to happen. But we do know Germany is positioning itself to take a stand and do something. But what's occurring is that there are international sanctions causing total chaos in Putin's Russia. Completely unexpected. I don't think anybody anticipated this was going to happen. The Russian market economy, it could implode. And Russians may lose the ability, and this is where it's really going to hurt, they may lose their ability to get a Big Mac, literally. i got to say, I've never seen anything like this. The only thing that I can compare it to is the unifying goal of the world at that time to build a Tower of Babel. I've never seen the world unite in the acquisition of one goal to stop Putin. I've never seen it. Now, maybe I'm not a wise observer and I've missed it, but I've read about it in the Bible. I'm not going to read you the story because you know the story. When people get together, they can do incredible things. They're doing incredible things right now. On March 18th, an article came out that said over 400 companies have withdrawn from Russia. 
over 400 companies. What could possibly convince the leaders of 400 major corporations to say, I don't want Russian customers. I don't want Russian distribution. I don't want Russian profits. You just think about that. Now, Russia is not the biggest economy in the world. And they're not as big as they think they are. But for every company that is doing a significant amount of business in that country, it's a big deal to that company. 400 companies as of March 18th said, I quit. For some Western brands like Burger King, Subway, Marks and Spencer, they have trouble doing this. Exiting the Russian market is easier said than done because they have franchise agreements. They have contracts in place. Some franchisees in the country don't want to stop. McDonald's pulled the plug and 400 companies followed suit. On March the 23rd, just a few days later, since the invasion of the Ukraine began, the report says now over 450 companies have announced their withdrawal from Russia. Originally conceptualized as a simple withdraw versus remain list, pay attention to that. There's a list. There's a man going around taking names. I'm serious. There are people watching. They are paying attention and they are reporting. Wait, you didn't pull your company out of Russia? You're a bad company. You're a bad person. You don't care about the right things. You just want profit. You think about that. In a few days, 50 additional companies joined the parade exiting Russia. There's no tyrant saying, I won't let you do business in Russia. There's a social conscience that is somehow come into a place of maybe equal power to a tyrant. You're a bad human being if you don't leave Russia. And I'm not saying it's not a good thing for them to leave Russia. I'm not saying it's not a good thing to, to gather together to stop a maniac from destroying innocent lives. I'm okay with that. But I'm here to tell you there's something else running in the background that causes me great concern. I downloaded the list, and these are household names. Ginormous corporations have just made the simple decision, we have to leave Russia. So let me ask you a question. There's a war in Ukraine. Russia invaded. The world organized in days, not in decades, not in years, not in months, really in hours. Somehow, some force came into play to say, we've got to do something. Something happened in an instant that caused the nation of Germany to totally eradicate everything they stood for politically and economically and to radically alter their existence. Fear. Something happened. What caused McDonald's to say, we're not going to sell big bags here anymore? I had seen articles of people were... Uh, selling for enormous amounts of money some remaining Big Macs and some McDonald's bags that they had in Russia. Those are the people of Russia wanting the American stuff. And the American stuff isn't going to be available anymore. We don't like you anymore. We won't play with you anymore because you're not playing nice in the world sandbox. And everybody's recognized that we got to stop that bully. Do you think he's the first bully? Do you think this is the first time a maniac did man maniacal things? 
We just haven't paid attention until somebody tweaked our social consciousness. Do you think that the people of the world couldn't have gotten together over something like a pizza party before they decided to do the Tower of Babel? Something tweaked their consciousness and they said, let us build. I'm telling you, something has tweaked the consciousness of the world to act now. Now. The world has united to punish Russia. It's nothing less than that. To punish Russia. You're a bad player on the international scene. We're Naive if we think he's the first bad player. He's not. We're naive to think he's the worst bad player. He's not. You know, he's probably, in his mind, a Christian. I assume he believes he's doing God's work. And the people who support him probably believe this is, this is an important thing that we're doing. I'm telling you, something has tweaked the world's conscience. And something has enabled that conscience to activate and create a unity that I've never seen. Maybe you have, but I've never seen. And I'm very concerned about it. The world has learned the trick. The, learn, the world has learned how to control the narrative. The world has learned how to disseminate the agenda. This is brand new. I think. And, and I've not heard people talking about it, but it's just, I think it's real. And maybe people are going to say, oh, you're a knucklehead. And maybe I am. You can decide for yourselves. But... I believe that the world has gathered to force everyone and everything to crush their enemies together. And if you refuse, you know, when there were only 400 companies that left, there were forces running in the background saying to those who hadn't agreed to leave, you're a bad player. You're a sympathizer of the enemy. Until somehow 50 more said, oh, I don't want to be labeled that. I want to be with the good guys. Who defines the good guys and the bad guys? Social media, the news, the people who don't like Russia. In Russia, it's a different story. You know, we celebrate the American Revolution, and I don't know, we hung or shot or drowned or did something bad to Benedict Arnold, but he was a hero in England. You know, it's all perspective, folks. So here's my question. Putin, pariahs, and pray for the peace of what? Somebody needs to ask the question, so I'm going to do it. Now that the world has figured out how to unite how to control, how to, how to manipulate the narrative for a good thing, if we want to call this a good thing, and I'm willing to go that far and say it's a good thing. Stop the maniac. I mean, we could have picked any maniac, but we picked that one, and that seems to work. And I'm okay with it. What I'm not okay with is, now that we know how it works, hear me. Who's next? Who will the world declare to be the next villain? And where does it stop?
there will be scapegoats before this is over. It'll end up at the feet of the Jews somehow. And it'll be at the feet of Christians as well. True Christians. There's a deplatforming reality that is taking place in our culture, in our society. Christians who I know. How many of you are on Facebook and you've been sent to Facebook jail? Okay? That's just a little taste of what you're speaking against what the good guys who control what's good and evil, you're speaking against what they believe is good. The Bible tells us that that's what's going to occur in the last days. And what days are we living in? Who's next? God loves you. God loves Israel. God has a promise for Israel. God has a promise for you. But the world will turn on Israel. When, you know, if you, if you come out with a anti-killing babies position, you can get crushed. If you come out with an anti men sleeping with men and women sleeping with women position, you can get crushed. If you come out with a strong pro-Israel position, you can get crushed by the pro-Palestinians who they want the prize. The enemies of God want the prize. God will not take his eyes off the prize. Stand with God. Watch the deplatforming that takes place for people who stand for the Bible. I'm telling you, you, it's happening right now. You may not see it, but it's happening right now. It's not just Facebook. It's big stuff. There are people totally losing their voices on social media. I mean, this is not too hard to figure out. If they can, if they can shut down the head of the free world and say, you can't put a Twitter thing out... They can do anything they want to do. I'm not saying he's good or bad. That's not the point. If they can stop what they stopped when they stopped it, what makes you think you'll have the freedom to say, hey, Jesus changed my life, and he's still in the life-changing business.